got a new name and glory let's all stand up and sing 349 go ahead and turn in your hymn books and let's stand and sing a new name in glory I was once a sinner but I came hardened to receive from my Lord this was freely given and I found that he always kept his word there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. At the white road, angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. Oh, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. My sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not the God's angry frown. When the heavens opened, and I saw that my name was written down, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white road angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Now we're going to sing that third verse when we get to the phrase, saved by grace. I want you to sing it and yell it loud, all right? So we're going to sing that part. Can you imagine the angels in the heaven, they rejoice when somebody's saved. And so I can't, I can't imagine what that would be like just to hear the angels one time when somebody gets saved. Praise the Lord. Let's sing the third verse. In the book it's written. In the book it's written, saved by grace. Oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am made whole. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white road angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more. Amen. Y'all can be seated. What a good song to start the service out on. I hope you're bound for heaven today and your name's been written down. Amen. One day, I don't know, a lot of men believe that we'll actually get a new name when we get to heaven. I know in the Bible you have a lot of characters that did get new names or their names were changed. Abraham and Sarah both had their names changed slightly. It was Abram to Abraham and Sarah to Sarah with an H on the end of it. And those were changes that God made when he made a change in their life. Same thing with Jacob. Jacob was changed to Israel. And then you had Saul, who was changed to Paul. And then also you had Simon, who was changed to Peter. 
So we had a lot of name changing going on in the Bible, didn't we? That's because names many times are reflective of character and nature. And I wonder how many of us will get a new name once we get into heaven. And that's going to be exciting, isn't it? And I like what Brother Benton was saying earlier. He says, that'd be great one day to hear the angels singing when somebody gets saved. And you know somebody's just got saved because they all burst out into chorus, don't they? Well, you know what? One day I think you'll get that chance. When we're in heaven during those seven years of tribulation, there are going to be people getting saved, won't there? And so if they're rejoicing in heaven over one sinner, then uh, there'll be some sinners getting saved during the tribulation period. We'll get a chance to see what that's like. That's going to be exciting, isn't it? I'm looking forward to that day. Hope you're looking forward to that day. If you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, I hope you get that settled today. Uh, get your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. We have a lot of theological terms that we use, don't we? But the Lamb's Book of Life simply is a book that is where all the people that trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior have their names written down on the day they get saved. And uh, whether you know the date and hour, God does, doesn't he? And I, I was saved when I was four. I don't know the exact day. I know the time period, but I don't know the exact time. But God's got all that logged down. And uh, one day when I get to heaven, I'll get to know some exact numbers. But all I know is that when I was four years old, my dad led me to Lord Jesus Christ, and I came to know him as my personal Savior. And what a thrill that must have been for my dad, but a bigger thrill for me, because now I'm a child of the King. And I hope today, if you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, you'll pull somebody aside. Anybody here can probably show, tell you how. Even if they don't think they can, they can, because if you got saved, you know how to get saved, don't you? Amen. And so and they'll tell you how to get saved. And that'd be a great thing, wouldn't it, to see someone get saved today? Great song. Good song to start off all right, we're glad for everybody who made it out today, and uh, we hope you have a good day here in the Lord's house. We are also thankful for some visitors that we have with us this morning. It's good to have Grant Bridges with us this morning. Y'all get an opportunity to go by, shake his hand, let him know how much you appreciate him being here. And then also, Chloe Thorne is visiting with us this morning, so I hope you'll get a chance to go by and let her know how much we appreciate having her here also. And so if you see someone you don't recognize this morning, uh, let them know we appreciate them being here. Go by, shake their hand, and welcome them into the house of God. Then also we have a, a few birthdays and uh, actually a birthday anniversary going on. On Thursday, one of our staff members has a birthday, and it's not me. So that limits it to two others, doesn't it? And the other one's not Brother Crutchfield. So that gives you a pretty good idea who it is, don't it? All right, Brother Luke's having a birthday. I hope you'll let him know how much you appreciate his service here. Maybe write him a card, give him a gift, and let him know how much, know, let him know how much you appreciate his ministry. And one of the things I love about Brother Benton is he wears many hats around here, and I've never once, anything I've asked him to do, he's never balked at it. He's never uh, even given me an attitude or anything about it. He's ready, willing and ready to do whatever I ask him. And I ask him to do a lot around here, and he does a lot around here. And so I hope you'll show your appreciation for that. And we have a box in the back, by the way, where you can put birthday cards that you can give to Brother Benton if you want. And uh, we'll collect those for him. If not, you can give it to him in person. But I encourage you to do that. Let him know how much you appreciate his ministry here at Central. And then also on Friday, Henry and Missy Mason have an anniversary, and they're in Arkansas this morning, but I hope maybe you get an opportunity to drop them a note, let them know how much you appreciate them, and uh, wish them a happy anniversary, and uh, let them know you're thinking about them and praying for them. All right, let's go to Lord in a word of prayer, and we will continue with our service this morning. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity we had to be here in the Lord's house. What a privilege it is to be able to worship God freely in a country that has granted us religious liberty. What a, what a wonderful thing. Amen. There are people today who are meeting in secrecy in order to be able to worship God. We don't have to worry about that, God. You've blessed us so much in this country, in this nation. May we never take it for granted. And, Lord, may we never allow it to be taken from us willfully, Lord. Uh, but may we defend what we have been given. And, Lord, I do pray and ask you this morning that as we worship you, Lord, that you would work so in our hearts that we would do so with a pure heart, wholeheartedly singing Praise unto your name, opening our hearts to the word of God and letting you work in our lives, Lord. We'll give you the honor, we'll give you the glory and the praise for all that you've done and most of all for sending your son Jesus Christ to die on a cross that we might have our name written down in heaven. Thank you so much, Lord, and bless the service as we pray in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning to you. Um, I have uh, many announcements um, uh, in my heart as well as what's written on this paper. Last night, Micah, my son, had um, a, a, some type of uh, change in his uh, potassium level and we had to go to the hospital. Um, while there, um, nearly every, uh, all these guys over here showed up at the hospital so quickly. Um, 
uh, social media. That uh, it all, everything happened so quickly. They uh, were there, and Micah is doing fine now. Uh, that yeah. discovered the issue. Uh, didn't even have a chance to call pastor. It, that, um, and I think part of that has to do with what D said to me yesterday when I saw D and some of these fellas out there filling that hole up that uh, Brother Franklin, Pastor, and Brother Ben, whoever, Doug, there was a water leak out here. Um, and uh, I said, well, D, I appreciate this. I really appreciate it, you helping. He said, but Mr. Crutchfield, this is my church too. And, um, and I love our church. Amen. I do, I love, love uh, this place. Also, um, there is a need, apparently it's written right here. If we start at the, at the end of the announcement, we'll go backwards, please see Crystal I snuggle today. That's what that, so if you are willing to help in the nursery, please see her today. Um, also, the deacons meeting is scheduled uh, for this evening after the evening service. And then put this address in your heart because uh, we want you to pray for the people who live there. It's 6301 Valley Drive. Star Valley Drive. Pray for Star Valley. I guess you could play for Valley too, but let's do Star Valley Drive and the people who live there. They are dear to us. Um, the Bible, ladies' Bible study will be held there. Um, uh, ladies, please, if you can attend, uh, do so on the 15th. And then um, another big part of my life is a Central Baptist School and its ministry, her ministry to this community. The teacher appreciation baskets uh, listed that uh, in the, you please sign up in the foyer also for um, the um, in services as well in service lunches as well but also if you can if you can smile and say welcome to Central Baptist School would you please consider being here on the first day of school August the 13th I would love for our church to welcome people to our school and welcome them, and, and, and just, um, I think one, one of the sisters said, well, brother, I don't know exactly what, where to tell them to go. Um, I, I think Sister Cassie told me, she said she had never been on the second floor. Just come on, uh, I'll give you a tour. Um, we have a marvelous school. So if you're able to be here one month in advance, I wanna give plenty of notice, if you're able to be there in the morning, or if you're able to be there in the afternoon at dismissal, able to just to, um, just come and welcome people and then at the end of the day um, uh, just uh, thank them for entrusting their children to Central Baptist School. Amen. Thank you brothers and sisters. I'll give you a quick update to our vacation Bible school that we had this week. Um, we had about 65 kids all together that we ended up being able to minister to this week. That was huge. We were so grateful to be able to do that. We had at least one young man um, that made a decision this week for Christ, and we'll just continue to follow up with that young man. He, you can pray for him. lives in a tough spot at home. Um, but we also had some others that raised their hand and just said, you know, they have questions. They're not sure about their salvation. And so you pray for us as we follow up with those folks and reach out to the families that they're coming from. And so we're glad that we were able to do that. I'll say this. I thank you, all the workers that have played a part in that. Could not have done it without you, and you did a superb job this week. Had hardly a hiccup. I mean, just some real small stuff, but you guys just did phenomenal, and it was a lot of fun. I was telling the kids, you know, it's just so, sometimes uh, Vacation Bible, somebody posted something on Facebook with a picture of uh, Jack Nicholas, I think, with his hair all crazy and said, yes, I am the VBS director or something like that. <clears throat> and yes, it can feel that way sometimes, but this week was wonderful, actually. It was just a great blessing, and I'm so glad I got a team like you guys that uh, makes, makes me look good, you know, like I know what I'm doing. But anyway, and so I just praise the Lord for it. We had a really good week. Thank you. If you're a teacher of a classroom in Sunday school or something like that, and you discover there's things that are there not supposed to be there, I'm sorry. We'll get it cleaned up soon. If there's things that are missing that are supposed to be there, let me know. We'll try to put it back. But things got moved around. But anyway, just let us know. And we just praise the Lord for all the good work and the outcome that we had this week.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, choir. Let's turn to 348 in your hymn book, and let's stand and sing, Redeemed. 348, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Us on the fourth, I know I shall see in His beauty. The King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever. Great job. Let's turn around and shake hands and welcome one another. And we'll come back and sing another song. All right, as you make your way back, let's sing the chorus of, our, of uh, Redeemed. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Now, if you pick up your hymn book one more time, we're going to sing I Run to Christ. It's in the very back of your hymn book. Just turn back a page or two. It's pasted in there. I Run to Christ. I run to Christ when chased by fear and find a refuge sure. Believe in me, his voice I hear, his words and wounds secure. I run to Christ when torn by grief and find abundant peace. I too had tears, he gently speaks, thus joy and sorrow meet. 
I run to Christ when worn by life and find my soul refreshed. Come unto me, he calls through strife, but he gives way to rest. I run to Christ when vexed by hell and find a mighty arm. The devil flees, the scriptures tell, he roars but cannot harm. I run to Christ when stalked by sin, and find a sure escape. Deliver me, I cry to him, temptation yields to grace. I run to Christ when plagued by shame, and find my one defense. I bore God's wrath, he pleads my case, my advocate and friend. Good singing. You may be seated. All right, we'll go ahead and have the men come forward at this time for the morning offering. And as they're making their way forward, I'm going to ask Brother Hughes if he would to pray for our offering this morning. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight By faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts Of a holy city built by God's own hands A place where peace and justice reign We will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith a prophet saw a day when the longed-for Messiah would appear With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave By faith the church was called to go and the power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver captives and to preach good news In every corner of the earth We will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved, 
and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I don't know about you all, but my heart's already been ministered to. Songs were great this, this morning, and just uh, felt God working through the songs as we were Worshiping the Lord with our voices. God talks about speaking to each other through hymns, songs, and spiritual songs. And uh, that's something you do when the Spirit of God has stirred your soul. And that's the way it ought to be when you're in church. Your soul ought to be stirred. It ought to be stirred by the music. It ought to be stirred by the message of the music. The Spirit of God ought to be able to get you fired up, ready to receive what the Spirit of God wants to speak to your heart about in the message. And uh, get that ground softened, made fertile to receive the seed of the Word, that it might get some root in there and produce some fruit in your life. And that's what we want, isn't it? It's great to be a Christian, isn't it? It's great to have God as your Savior and know that He's still working on you. And God's not through with you yet, are you? And as I was listening to that song, my heart was challenged, and I thought about something I've thought about often as a Christian, as a minister, And as a servant of the Lord, and that is, I I want, I don't know about you all, but I want to finish strong. I do not want to tail off at the end of my life. I I want to be able to serve God like Moses did all the way to the very end, and the Bible will be able to say the same thing about me as it said about him and Caleb and Joshua, that their strength did not abate, and their eyes did not wax dim. But all the way to the end, they had a fervent heart for God to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that and I have to be careful when I say this because I don't want to offend anybody when I say this, but growing up in a Western culture, in a Western society, we develop a retirement mentality. We're conditioned to develop a retirement mentality. There's no such thing in the Bible. God's retirement plan is heaven, all right? And it's a pretty good retirement plan, by the way. Got a great insurance package up there for you, okay? God said he's got an inheritance reserved for you that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven, eternal. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? The life you live now is what really counts for the Lord. Because this is your opportunity to serve God. This is your opportunity to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to be like Paul, man. I want to get down to the end of my life and say, I'm ready. I'm ready to see my Savior. I've done everything that God's given me to do. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Now, will you listen to the song? I have kept my, the faith. See, that's what that song was about. We don't walk by sight, but we walk by what? By faith. And it was talking about walking and staying with the God and following Him all the way to the end and finishing what you started for the Lord Jesus Christ on the day that you were born into His family. And God has a part for you, by the way. Some folks never find their part in the body of Christ. They never find it. That's a sad tragedy. To never find out what God's purpose for your life was while you were here on this earth. But God said He had a purpose for you before the world ever began, and it was found in Christ Jesus. Oh, and there's nothing greater. I can testify to this with all my heart and soul. There is nothing greater than finding exactly what God has purposed you to do and then doing it. Oh, does it, is it easy all the time? No, but is it rewarding? Yes, it is. And God will give you those handfuls on purpose along the way, and He'll bless you, and He'll give you fruit, and He'll do little things that'll make it worth everything that you've sacrificed, everything that you've suffered, everything that it's cost you, everything that you've given up. You sit back and you go, it's worth it just for that one thing. Do you realize this? 
If you spent your whole life serving, sacrificing for the Lord Jesus Christ, and only one soul came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, it would be worth it all. But you have to develop a heart of a servant. You have to develop the kind of heart that God can speak to. And when He speaks to, you can act. See, that's what God's looking for. He's looking for people that can act when He speaks to their heart. Nothing's more frustrating to a parent than having to prod and pry and pull and drag your kid to do something that you ask them to do. That's frustrating, isn't it? Isn't it nice to have your kid do something immediately when you say it? I don't know if you ever remember hearing this when you were growing up, but I've heard this a few times. Uh, Maybe your parents said this to you. Maybe someone else said it. Maybe you heard someone else say it. But sometimes parents will use this expression when they're trying to express the obedience they want to see from their children. When I say jump, all I want you to say is, how high? (laughs) You know what? That's what God wants from us. When he speaks, he wants us just to ask, what do you want, Lord? What What did Samuel say? When God could get a hold of Samuel's heart, and he, and, and he finally realized who was speaking to him, what did he say? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And today we're, we're, we've been going through kind of a little series, within a series, dealing with the different types of healings that Christ performed upon individuals during his ministry. We've been looking at the spiritual parallel to physical infirmities, is what we've been looking at. We began by looking at the parallel between people who can't see physically to people who cannot see spiritually. And we see that sometimes that people that have perfect eyesight in this world are the ones that are really blind and do not see what God wants them to see. We looked at that the first week. Then last week we looked at a man who had a hearing problem. He was deaf and he had a speech impediment. And we saw the spiritual parallel there between our ability to hear the Lord. In fact, God gave some scripture to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. And I've often thought this must have been, I don't know how Isaiah did it. Because if God had come to me when he called me and he said what he said to Isaiah, whenever I started my ministry, I might have not started my ministry. But when he came to Isaiah, and Isaiah finally surrendered to the Lord, and he said, here am I, Lord. And and God, when he was speaking to me, he said, whatever your will is, that's what I'll do. Whatever you want me to do. And God said, I want you to go and speak to the house of Israel. And he says, having eyes to see, they shall not see. And having ears to hear, they shall not hear. And you know what he was telling them? You're going to go and do a ministry, and you will see little to no fruit in your ministry. But I still want you to go. That I can call them into witness one day that they will know that I spoke to them and told them the truth and that they heard it and that they rejected it. Well, that'd be a tough ministry to have, wouldn't it? That'd be a tough ministry to have. You've got to be a special kind of person to do a ministry where you know God's called you to and you may not ever see any fruit in it. You just may be preparing the ground for something later to come. See, God needs individuals that are fully surrendered to Him. And when God speaks to them, they're willing to act when God speaks. Regardless of how difficult the ministry might be, regardless of how difficult the thing that God calls on them to do might be, regardless of the sacrifice or the suffering that they might go through. I was reading a little bit about Jeremiah. And I was going through some verses about his ministry. Have you ever really studied the life of Jeremiah and the ministry that he had as a prophet? He was talking about being cast into the dungeon and being left down there where waters overflowed him. And what he was talking about was a pit that he was put in that literally he was up to his waist or maybe more in miry muck and gunk. And they left him down in there because he was preaching the Word of God and preaching the truth to people who did not want to hear it. And in fact, did you know Jeremiah got to a place in his life where he said, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I've I've had enough of it. And buddy, he tried to turn his back on the ministry of God. And the Bible says it was like a fire shut up in his bones. And that as much as he tried to not do what God called him to do, he couldn't stand it. See, God's got to find some folks that have that kind of fire and desire in them. That even when things get so tough, you want to quit, you can't quit. Because you're consumed with what God has called you to. To do. Most folks have a higher time finding what it is God called them to do. 
much less developing that kind of passion and that kind of desire toward what God has called them to do. Well, we can get passionate about a lot of things, can't we? We've got our favorite sports teams. We get pretty passionate about that. Some folks paint themselves all different colors. Paint letters on their chest and everything else. Stand out in the freezing cold to cheer on a bunch of guys going back and forth over the same piece of ground doing nothing. With a ball filled with air. You know, sports itself speaks of vanity. Now, I'm not against sports. I like sports. But most sports have these balls that are inflated with air, and that helps you understand just how vain the thing is that they're worshiping and celebrating. It's full of what? Nothing. <laughs> now, I'm not against sports. I'm a big sports man. I like baseball. I love, I'm a hockey team for the St. Louis Blues just won the Stanley Cup. I enjoy that stuff, but I try to do it in moderation. And I try to keep in perspective what's really important and what's not really important. God doesn't have a problem with you enjoying life. He made life to be enjoyed. But God never wants you to enjoy life at the expense of ministry and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants people he can speak to, and when he speaks to, they can drop whatever they're doing, and they can do whatever God calls them to do. So the first week we looked at blindness. second week we looked at hearing, and we saw how hearing affected speech. Because if you can't hear the way you speak, you normally don't speak properly, do you? And a lot of people have a problem hearing the way they speak to others. And so many times they'll say things in ways that hurt people. And they don't hear it. They don't recognize it. They're not sensitive. They don't have the discernment to realize they're using words in a way God never meant words to be used. To hurt and to harm people. And God always meant for words to be something to build and edify and help people go in the right direction in their life. But this week we want to look at something a little bit different. We're going to look at another healing of Christ, and we want to look at its spiritual parallel. We find this in Matthew chapter 12. And looking in Matthew chapter 12 and verses 9, beginning in verse 9 and going down through verse 13. Verse 9 says, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched forth his hand, and it was restored whole like as the other. Today we want to look at the spiritual parallel here of someone with a withered hand. But I want you to notice something. You'll see a common refrain within these stories many times that he normally puts something in there that shows you the person with the real problem isn't the person with the physical problem. Now notice it again. Let's read it again. Going back again, and we'll start in verse 10 this time. And behold, there was a man which, his, with, which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on a Sabbath day that they might accuse him? Notice what they're not concerned with. They're not concerned with the man who has the problem. They're not concerned at all about him, are they? they don't, they're, and because of that, they're not able to rejoice when Jesus heals him. There's a lot of Christians like that, by the way who get all caught up in somebody else and, and, and what they're doing or not doing, that they can't enjoy what God is doing. We ought to be able to enjoy when God is doing something in other people's lives. We ought to be able to rejoice with them when that takes place, shouldn't we? Then he goes on there, and I want you to see this now. He gives a little parable. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a what? A pit on the Sabbath day. He's describing a creature that is caught in a circumstance that they cannot get themselves out of. But notice the phrase he uses next. Will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? So who's got the hand problem? The man with the withered hand or the Pharisees? See, they can't lay hold of what God wants them to lay hold of. They can't minister to who God wants them to minister because they can't see the person and their need, and therefore God cannot touch their heart. And the Bible says over in Lamentations, Jeremiah speaking again, said, mine eye hath affected my heart. 
See, God's got to be able to show us some stuff and speak to our hearts to move us to action to do some things. But many times God can't speak to our hearts and therefore we're like the man with a withered hand. It's drawn up and it cannot reach out and lay hold and minister to those who God wants us to minister to. Hands are important, aren't they? The Bible has a lot to say about hands, by the way. I think of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 25 and 26. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Here's a man who refuses to labor because he's slothful. But it says the righteous man, he's the man that's not slothful, by the way. He's out there taking and giving what he has rather than desiring and lusting after something he does not have and he's unwilling to work for. <laughs> God wants us to understand hands are something important. And the Bible has a lot to say spiritually about hands in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 10, 18 says this, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of hands the house droppeth through. Boy, I'm so thankful for those men that came out here. I called up Brother Randy Jr. yesterday, and I said, Randy, I said, we got a bunch of rain coming in. There's supposed to be a hurricane that's going to come right up through the Mississippi Valley area, and it's going to dump a bunch of rain on us. We had dug a ditch. We were out here, and I'm thankful for the men, Brother uh, Jim and Brother D and some of the other ones that were out there, Brother Benton. They were out there till Friday night till midnight working on digging that up and repairing that pipe that was busted and, and it was leaking out there in the, in the front of our property. And, but we didn't get it filled back in because we weren't going to turn the water on until the next day. We wanted to give it a chance to sit overnight and let the pipe set up real good. And so I came in the next day, I turned the water on. But I had a bunch of other stuff I had to do Saturday, and there's no way I could get over here to fill that ditch back in. And Jim was going out of town. That's why we worked on it all night so we could get it done. So he wasn't going to be here. So I called Randy Jr. up and said, Randy, can you find some guys to get over here and fill that ditch in? Because we've got a bunch of rain coming. I don't want it to all wash away and, and be gone. And so those guys came over here and they filled that ditch in yesterday and got it all done for me. But if I had had some guys that were slothful and lazy, we'd have a ditch over there that'd still be open. And we'd have a bunch of rain coming through and it'd leave us in a much greater condition, worse condition than we were. The Bible says the house droppeth through because of idleness of hands. People unwilling to work who have the ability to work. One of the things I refuse to do, you can find fault with me if you want to, that's fine, I don't care. But I, one thing I refuse to do is I refuse to give money to a healthy, grown adult male standing on a corner begging who could be working. If they have a bad condition where they can't work, if they're female or they got some other issues going on, I will give to those people. But if it's a grown man who can be working and he's out begging, he's not getting a dime from me. God doesn't reward slothfulness and laziness. And we're right now in a, in a situation here in America. By the way, you live in America. There's nothing you cannot do in this country and earn money yet. If you want to, you can go out and cut somebody's grass and earn money if you want to. And there's plenty of people. All you've got to do is underbid the other fellow who just came in and, and gave them a bid on their yard, and they'll give you the job. If you really want to make money in this country, you can make money. You have to have the heart to work and do what's necessary to make money. God doesn't like slothfulness. God doesn't like laziness. That post applies to Literal and to spiritual. God wants us to be spiritually active. In fact, one of the things he said when he left here, and when he was talking about his leaving this world, he gave a parable, and he said, I want you to occupy till I come. And that word occupy means to be busy about the master's business. In fact, he goes on to say, let your lights be burning, and your aprons girded on, and be ready, for you know not the hour he might return. You know what God wants to find every one of us doing when he gets back, when he comes back? Working for him. Have you ever been caught on the job not working? That happened to me once. Once. <laughs> I was working for a buddy of mine. Actually, he was over the job. And I was working for a man framing houses. And he had stopped me. He was a Christian. And we were working together. And it was just the two of us framing out a house. And the crews were short, and he had a bunch of different jobs, and he had to get somebody started on the job. So me and him were over here showing up and doing some work so that they didn't think we were, were neglecting a job. So we were there working on the job, and he stopped me to talk to me about some theological issue. Worst thing you can ever do to a preacher is ask him some theological question. 
And so I stopped for a minute, and I leaned up against the sawhorse, and I began to dis- discuss some topic we were talking about. And this was happened all within less than five minutes' time. And guess who walked up on the job? The boss's son. And he went up one side and down the other side of both of us. What are you guys doing standing here? My dad's paying you guys to work. Why aren't you guys working? You need to be working. Nothing's going to get done if you're standing around talking all the time. And he went up one side and down the other side. And there's no worse feeling than getting caught standing around doing nothing by the boss. And the last thing you want to do is when Jesus returns, be caught doing nothing for the Lord. You want to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. To do that, you've got to have hands that are healthy and viral and strong that can serve God and are not weak in condition. And God speaks a lot about weak hands in the Bible. And He always results in weak hands to a faint heart and an unwillingness, for one reason or another, to do what God called you to do. Hands are important in getting things done, aren't they? And God gave us hands for a reason, didn't He? Because He expects us to be those that labor and work. So He gave us hands to work with. Hands are an integral part of performing what we determine to do in our minds, isn't it? It's hard to do most activities or work without hands. You can't build things, can you? you can't, it's hard to drive a vehicle without hands. It's hard to cut a yard. It's hard to cook a meal. hard to paint a picture. hard to play sports without hands, isn't it? Now, there are some exceptions to that. There are some things that people do. I had a guy, uh, his name was Chris Hartwick. Uh, he was older than me in high school. We went to high school together. He was several years older than me. He was born with a deformity, and both of his arms were very skinny, and, and, and he, could not, he had no use of them. They were both in like this. He didn't walk real well either, but he had braces on his legs, and he walked. But I've never seen a guy as handicapped as him do as much as he did. It helps me to understand that many of us who think we can't do something could do a whole lot more if our minds were set on it. I watched him feed himself without the use of his hands. He had a special contraption that was set up that he could use to place and balance his fork on. And he would take the fork and he would put it in his mouth and he would scoop up whatever food he wanted to eat and he would put it on this little thing and then he would spin it around and he would eat it. He didn't expect nobody to feed him, he didn't expect nobody to take care of him. He was one of the greatest artists you ever saw. He could take a pen with his mouth, or a paintbrush with his mouth, and he could do things most people couldn't do with their hands. And in fact, I think he went into graphic design is what he ended up going into. It's amazing to watch him do some things, but there was a lot of things he could not do. He never played sports, never could play soccer, never could play basketball, never could drive. Someone had to drive him wherever he went. Hands are important, aren't they? We need our hands to do things. And God uses that and helps us to understand some things when He talks about hands in the Bible. Think of the activities you could not do if you did not have the use of your hands. Hands are necessary to function fully in life. You might be able to do some things, but there are certain things you'd never be able to do. Even those of us who have functioning hands sometimes have difficulty doing things when our hands aren't functioning properly, don't they? This last week, I've been experiencing quite a bit of pain in my hands. I've been doing a lot of work the last several weeks on my house and on moving and different things. And I wake up in the morning sometimes and I have an incredible amount of joint pain. And I got up this morning and I went to sit down and, and go over my notes and study and add anything else I wanted to add into my message and just go over everything and make sure I had everything down pat. And I went to get me a cup of coffee. And I sat my cup of coffee off on the left-hand side of me. And it's my left hand that really hurts me probably more than anything else. And I remember wanting to get a drink of that coffee. And I reached over and tried to grab that cup. And I could hardly squeeze and hold the cup of coffee that I wanted to pick up. Because my hand was in that much pain. And it hurt that much. It made it very hard to grip something. The other day, I was putting a mounting, a TV mount on the wall. And I was trying to tighten the, the nuts up, on the wing nuts on there, on, on a certain part of that. And one hand, I could tighten the wing nut up real good. But with my other hand, because of its pain and it hurting and being weak, I could only tighten it so far. I'd have to literally get in an awkward angle so I could use my other hand to tighten it the rest of the way. Now, I'm 48 years old, but I'm already experiencing limitations on what I can and can't do because of my body. And it's not operating the way it was designed to operate. See, God designed your body in such a way to be able to do certain things. And when your body does not function the way God designed your body to function, you cannot do the things that you ought to do or the things that you want to do. And many of us are the same way spiritually. 
we have spiritual problems. We have spiritual arthritis. We have spiritual withering of the hand. We have spiritual difficulties that keep us from doing things the way God wants us to do and performing the actions that God wants us to perform. So hands are important, aren't they? They're an important part of serving the Lord and and working for God. Spiritually speaking, they they help us to understand some great things. So hands represent our ability to do and carry out responsibilities that have been committed to us. And our ability to do certain things is directly related to our physical mobility that we possess in our hands. If our hands are limited in, in some physical way, then we are limited in what we can do. And many of you know that. You maybe can't pick things up like you used. You may not be able to do different activities you like to, to do. You know, one of the things I see often out here, and this isn't the hands, this is more the legs and the knees and stuff, but one of the things I notice is a lot of folks can't take those stairs out there anymore. And some of them, they walk up the ramp because they have a hard time going up the steps. And I had to, <laughs> I had to laugh at myself this morning. I'm a little sore and I'm a little stiff. I did a little extra work yesterday. And so my body's really, I woke up this morning just really stiff and, stiff and sore. And so I'm up on the second floor teaching my Sunday school class and I'm on my way down and I'm just taking my time going down man, taking my steps down there. And coming behind me is the young singles class. And I can hear them catching up quick. <laughs> I'm like, I got to get to the bottom of the steps before they run me over, <laughs> you know. And I just got out the door, and down comes Randy Jr., and all the other guys come running right in behind me. And I looked at Randy, and I go, man, it's nice to be spry and young, isn't it? <laughs> you can spring about and do all kinds of things when you're young. I remember in the, in the Christian school that I went to, we had this big gymnasium, and there was a huge stage. And they had a stage that was about that high, uh, that, we, that we used to do all our plays and stuff like that on. And when I was young, I used to see if I could stand next to it and jump all the way up and get onto that stage. I, I could do it. I could jump all the way up. It's probably about close to, not quite five foot, but maybe four and a half feet. up. Uh, and I could jump, standing still, I could jump in one motion and jump on top of that stage. If I did that today, I would kill myself. I might get two foot up. Might get two foot up on that thing. But it would be a, you, if you had your camera on me and you were filming me, that would be a YouTube sensation. <laughs> There's just things you can't do as you get older. You lose your mobility and your ability to do things like you once used to do. That's part of your body breaking down. You know what that really is? That's the effect of sin and death on your body. As your body is breaking down over time. And God wants us to understand that all these things that we see are not just things that are coincidence, but they are things that God designed to speak to our hearts. That many times we spiritually begin to break down. And we don't do things like we should do as Christians if we were fully healthy. What we could do if we were fully healthy. God wants us to understand that. There are different things that take their toll on us in life. If you work a construction job, and I remember thinking about this, I remember back several years ago before I took the pastorate, I was bivocational. And I always did ministry while serving, but I've always uh, had my second job in the area of construction. In my last job, I was working for a company that primarily worked in concrete. And if you've ever poured concrete, you know how difficult pouring concrete can be. Concrete's heavy. And I remember my first day on the job, It was one of those typical Memphis summers where you had like 110 heat index. First day on the job, I've never poured concrete in my life. I'm working at Valero Construction Company, and they put me in a jumpsuit, fire retardant jumpsuit over the top of my jeans and my long sleeve shirt. I go down there, I got my cap on, I got my boots on, I had to take off one pair of boots and put on a pair of rubber boots, and they, and they take me over to this concrete where they're pouring, they put a rake in my hand, and they say, drag that over here. I take the rake and I put it down, and the stuff's already started hardening. Now, I know nothing about concrete, I don't know if this is normal or not normal. I try to drag the stuff, and I can't even drag it, I have to hit it, break it, and pull it over. And what had happened was, is they had ordered this concrete, and in the heat, concrete really begins to react and set up. And what happens is is they had ordered this concrete and the concrete company was taking its time getting there and they were behind and they weren't getting the trucks to them fast enough and the concrete they had already poured began to set up. 
And I'm out there probably an hour, and I'm drenched in sweat, and I'm dying. I'm like, I need a drink of water. It was my first day. I don't want to look like I'm some wimp, and I'm out there. But there was about two or three times I got overheated, and I thought I wasn't going to make it through the day. And they probably were trying to test me out, too. Because they figured if I made it through the day, I'd stick around a while. But if I didn't make it through the day, they just, they just helped get rid of a fellow that probably somewhere down the road was going to quit on him anyway. And I don't know how I made it through that day, but I made it through that day. Construction work is hard work. Construction work will take its toll on your body. And I remember after I worked there for about five or six years, I remember thinking, I cannot do this the rest of my life. At some point, I'm going to have to find a job that's easier on the body. Because of how difficult. There's many times my backs went out, I had problems and different things, physical ailments and different things that happened to me. And I realized something, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Why? Because the body begins to break down over time. And there's things that happen to you that cause the body to break down even faster. And the same thing is true spiritually. There are things that can happen in your life that can take their spiritual toll on you. I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times where somebody does something that's offensive, hurts somebody, accuses somebody of something, mistreats somebody, doesn't recognize somebody, and those people develop a withered hand. And they're no longer willing to serve God because of the way they have been treated. That happens to people. What are you going to do? Because you know what the Bible teaches me? If you live godly, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to be put, people are going to mistreat you. And sometimes if you, if you read your Bible and you know your Bible, guess who are some of the people that mistreat you the worst and most often? The people closest to you. The people you at least expect it to happen. Turn to Genesis chapter 49 for a minute. We'll try to close up on this, and we'll come back and pick this up next week, all right? But I want to at least look at this passage, talk about it a little bit, and then we'll be through. Genesis chapter 49. And, of course, this is the latter part of the book, but this is Joseph speaking. Now, if you know the story of Joseph, what happened to Joseph as a young boy? He was mistreated by his brethren, wasn't he? He was falsely accused by his boss's wife. And all these different things happened. He was neglected by two men that he helped while he was in jail. So issue after issue, things keep happening in Joseph's life that a lesser man would have ended their service for God. They would have given up, they would have been faint, and they would not have had the heart to do the things that Joseph did. But Joseph makes this comment, or these things are said about Joseph here in the Word of God, here in Genesis 49 and verse 22. And here's what the Word of God said. Of course, this is Jacob actually speaking about his different sons, and when he comes down to Joseph, this is what Jacob says about Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough. Even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Man, what a great passage. I've gone over that. I've read that many times. I've gone over it. Never saw what I saw in it this week as I, as I was studying it. What a great passage. Because in this passage, what God helps you to understand is, Joseph, if any man had an excuse to give up, to be faint-hearted, to get bitter, to get angry, and not want to do anything, and want to seek vengeance, it was Joseph. All Joseph ever tried to do was do good. And all he ever got was being mistreated by others. And there's nothing that will cause a person to not want to do good than to be mistreated when you are doing good. And if you're spiritually not healthy and you're spiritually not strong, you will be broken down by this world. It will take its toll on you. You have to learn how to be strong by the hand of the Almighty. And you have to learn how to help Him help you overcome. That's what the story of healing by Jesus is. It's all about Jesus' ability to overcome the infirmities that happen in life. As our bodies begin to break down and the problems we begin and the issues we have and the people that mistreat us, if God's not there, if Jesus, the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon, 
If that great physician is not there to put the medicinal medicine upon your heart, you're going to have some issues down the road, and you're going to not be able to serve God the way God wants you to serve him. You will draw that hand up, and you will not serve him. But notice what it says in the first two verses there. Back to verse 22. Joseph is a what? A fruitful bough. Even a fruitful vow by a what? By a will. I was talking to a, a man once, and I was, at this time I was kind of interested in trying to get the garden started. And he was telling me about experience he had. He had planted a watermelon patch. And he had just planted it because he just wanted a few watermelons to come up that he would be able to have for himself and his family. He wasn't trying to sell them or anything like that. But when he went out there, he said that thing began to grow like crazy. He said, I had so many watermelons, I didn't know what to do with it. He said it just grew everywhere in the biggest, greatest, luscious watermelons you ever saw in your life. But what he came to find out later on was why, the, why it was fruitful. There had been a wellspring that was right underneath where he planted that garden. And those roots had gone right down into that wellspring and was drawing water from that thing constantly. And then he said, I couldn't keep up with it. He said, I had to give them away. I couldn't do it. I had more watermelons than I knew what to do with. God wants you to learn how to tap into the wellspring he's put in. God said that when you got saved, he put the Holy Spirit of God right inside of you. And it would be like a river of water flowing out of your belly. It's a river of life, and it's medicinal in its nature. And it's designed to bring healing to anybody who can tap into it and receive virtue out of it. See, God said what Joseph learned how to do, and here's where you have to be able to know Scripture and what the Bible teaches throughout the Word of God. Joseph learned how, when he was hurt by others, how to tap into the healing power of God and let God heal him where it was most important in the inner man. A lot of people are carrying a lot of wounds and a lot of scars and a lot of disease and a lot of problems from things that other people have done to them or just how life has treated them, and they've never gotten healing from it. And they've never gotten healing because they've never learned how to tap into the river that God placed in them that provides the healing necessary to overcome the offenses of life. God says, woe unto them that bring needless offense, but then he turns right around and he says, but offense must needs come. They're going to happen. You're going to have things. People are going to do things to you. If you work around sinners, they're going to hurt you at some point or another. And that includes your own family. And the reason many times family members hurt you more than anybody else is just because you're around them more than anybody else. And they're sinners just like anybody else. And the more you're around a sinner, the more opportunities they have to hurt you. How do you deal with it when it happens? Are you able to go to God? Are you able to get God help you overcome those things that happen in your life? See, God was able to help Joseph overcome how other people had treated him. And he was still fruitful. In fact, he was so fruitful. Let's go on. Let's read the latter part of that verse. Whose branches run over the wall. What's that mean? What's the imagery God's painting there? That other people got to enjoy the fruit of Joseph. It wasn't just contained within himself. But it ran over the outside where other people could grab it as they went by. See, you have to understand the imagery that God is painting there. Of the custom of vineyards back then. And many, many, many Israelites had their own personal little garden area with vineyards. And in those vineyards, they had a little watchtower sometimes, or they had a watch guard who watched over that and who was there to protect it from any enemies that might come in. That's where you get in the Song of Solomon. It talks about the little foxes that destroy the vine. And how you have to guard and watch over it so that the fruit's not stolen away from you. Well, what he's pointing here is that the fruit is grown and everything within that vineyard is so grown that it grows over the walls to the outside so that he's got plenty on the inside as well as plenty to share on the outside. That's a healthy Christian. An unhealthy Christian is one who tries to keep the fruit all to themselves. He's got a withered hand that is unable to reach out and give to others, and minister to others. Next time we're together, we'll look, at the, we'll look at this in the virtuous woman found in Proverbs 31. I'll challenge you in the time between now and next day, go and study Proverbs 31. Find how many times the word hands are mentioned. 
Then look at how many times hands are indirectly used within the Psalm or within the Proverbs 31 woman. Because you know what the Proverbs 31 woman is? She's the ideal wife. She's the wife that God wants every woman to be. If she's healthy in her heart, soul, spirit, mind, and body. It's the woman that God designed every woman to be. And that without sin and death at work in you, this is the kind of woman that every woman would be. But it's the sin that affects us and the effects of the body that affect us and keep us from being everything that God wants us to be. By the way, I could very easily do the same for men, but there's not one particular passage given about the valorous man. There's passages that deal with valor. And by the way, valor and virtue are two, are, are two sides of the same coin. One deals with the man, one deals with the woman. And when men are what God wants men to be, they are men of valor. They're not fearful. They're not controlled by their fears. They're men of faith. They're men who are willing to take on challenges. They're willing to win the fight for what God has given them. And they're men who understand their roles and responsibilities and do what God has given them to do. And that's all the Proverbs 31 woman is. She's a woman that understands her roles and responsibilities as assigned to her by God, and she worketh willingly with her hands. There's nothing restricting her and keeping her from being who God wants her to be. She is a healthy woman with healthy hands. And that's what God wants for all of us. So we'll look at that example given to us in Proverbs 31 next time we're together. But God here wants us to understand the importance of having strong hands. When we come back, we'll finish up that thought and we'll lead that into our Proverbs 31 example. All right? But God does not want us to have a withered up hand that is unwilling to do what God has called us to do. Hands in the Bible are always a picture of service and work and labor. And God wants us to learn how to work and labor and fulfill the responsibilities He's called every one of us to. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye were called. I love the fact that it uses that word vocation because that automatically summons up in your mind the picture of somebody working. You ever went to high school? When you went to high school, did you have any kids that went to Votech school? What do they teach them in Votech school? A trade. They teach them a trade, doesn't they? And that's working with your hands. God wants you to understand he gave you hands for a reason. That's to go to work. And God wants you to learn how to work for him. And when he calls on you to be ready and willing to work. The only follower, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the principles that are taught that teach me what a healthy child of God ought to be and what I would be doing when I'm healthy like I ought to be and what my heart would be like if it's healthy in response to God's call on my life. May we never forget this, Lord. May it be something that will find root in our hearts and produce fruit in our lives, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen. Y'all would stand with me and turn to 496, I surrender all. What a great song to sing in lieu of what we're talking about. I surrender all, 496, that God has spoken to your heart. There's a place here that you can come and meet with the Lord. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thine. 
Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. The word that's used for strong there in the text in Genesis 40, 49, where it says he was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. It comes from an actual Hebrew word that's defined as agile or able to be light on their feet or light in their movement. And, I, you know, I thought about that, you know, and I looked at that word agility, and it means the ability to move quickly and easily. That's what God wants for all of us. When he calls in us to have the ability to move quickly and easily to do what he says. I'm so thankful that I have some young men in this church that I can call up, and if I need something done, I don't get a bunch of excuses. But I get a bunch of, we'll get that done. We'll take care of it. We'll have it done before the day's over. That's a blessing for every pastor to have folks like that in their church. And we have a church. We do. We have a good church of workers. We do. So I don't want you to think this is any sort of a, 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 a impugment upon you guys. We have some good workers in this church, man. We just saw that this last week with Vacation Bible School. All the folk, we had a lot. We had almost as many workers as we had kids. That's great. That is what you want to see. When there's a call to work, you want to see people that are what? They have the ability to move quickly and easily to do what God calls on them to do. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And that's a commendation for the church. But we all need to be challenged. We can all do better from time to time, can't we? All right, then I hope that maybe God has spoken to your heart this morning. Brother Benton, if you would, pray for us. Our Father, we thank you that you've given us the ability to work. Lord, I thank you for the physical ability. And Lord, I thank you for opportunities that you open doors for us. Lord, help us to see, have eyes to see the needs when they come up. See where it is that you want us to put our hands to the task. And Lord, I pray that the opportunities that you've given us, Lord, help us to not be slack in taking those opportunities. And may we see fruit from it. I pray that you'll bless us now as we go out, our families, keep us safe through the rain, and bring us back at the appointed hour tonight to worship you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.